Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I'm the Henry Kissinger Chair and Director of the International Security Program here at CSIS. And it is uh, my great honor today to introduce Jim Comey, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. As I'm sure most of you here know, Director Comey began his government service as an assistant United States attorney. He prosecuted the Gambino crime family in the Southern District of New York and the perpetrators of the Cobar Towers terrorist bombing in the Eastern District of Virginia. <coughs> In 2002, he was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, where he oversaw a number of major terrorism cases and created a specialized unit to prosecute international drug cartels. In 2003, he was unanimously confirmed as Deputy Attorney General, and 10 years later, he was confirmed as FBI Director, where he has continued to exhibit the integrity and dedication to the rule of law that has been a hallmark of his career. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Director Comey. Thanks so much. I'm so tall, I decided not to stand up to talk to you all. Uh, so now I can see people on the, the nice side of the room over here. Uh, so happy birthday. I didn't get you anything, but thanks for inviting me over. Uh, I was present at the conception of the National Security Division, and then there was a long period of gestation, and so I was not there for the birth. Ten years ago, I left as Deputy Attorney General in August of 2005, so I was part of, and very much thought we ought to, create an NSD, and then I came back when you were seven years old, three years ago, and so what I thought I would offer, just very briefly before you and I start chatting, is two perspectives born of that Rip Van Winkle experience of going away, and coming back eight years later, and going away in a real um, sense in that not only left Washington, D.C., I'd never expected to come back to government, and so I wasn't really focused on, other than being a newspaper reader, exactly how things were going, and now I got a chance to come back and see what was going on while I wasn't paying attention. And I was struck by many things, but two I just want to mention for this audience. The first is the jointness of things. I was very much struck coming back after eight years away to take the FBI in particular at how integrated we had become with the other parts of the intelligence community, state and local partners, the US military, how much smarter and better our country had gotten at going to the fight, I'm talking about terrorism now, with a fuller toolbox. It was remarkable. And that was uh, manifested in obviously information sharing, but in humans. The number two person in the FBI's national security branch when I arrived back was a CIA officer, and still is. Sits at my table every morning and knows everything I do, everything I'm worried about. It's an extraordinary penetration of our agency. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but that is both symbolic and reflects a reality, which is a recognition that really was, became a reality after I left government, that although we have different responsibilities, different authorities, different focuses, to be effective, the circles have to not just touch, they have to overlap in appropriate ways. So I was struck by the jointness of things, and I was also struck by the extraordinary growth and integration of the FBI's intelligence workforce, especially our great intelligence analysts, and the way in which they were involved in everything that the FBI was doing. So we had gotten better, thanks to Bob Mueller and a whole lot of other people, at asking and answering a very small set of questions. What do we know? What do we need to know? How does what we just found out connect to other things we know? And who needs to know this stuff that we just found out? And we had gotten so much more disciplined and rigorous at driving those questions into everything we did that it was extraordinary. Now, we've tried to make that even better. We're trying to even drive better integration between our operations and our intelligence. We're training our analysts and our agents together at Quantico. They sit in the same classrooms, they wear the same color golf shirts, they work out together, they, unlike the show Quantico, there isn't that much extracurricular activity going on down there. Um, they work out together, they eat in the cafeteria together, and they learn what each of them brings to the mission so that when the analysts graduate in 10 weeks and go out to their field offices, they know the rhythm of a counterterrorism squad, a cyber squad, a criminal squad, a, 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 a a squad of any kind and the importance of that integration. And the agents stay another 10 weeks and then they graduate and when they hit the field, they know 
the value of that tremendous, uh, tremendously talented cadre of intelligence analysts. So we took something remarkable and we're trying to improve it even still. But that jointness of things struck me. The second thing that struck me is, may strike you as odd, but I hope it resonates, the velocity of fear uh, that terrorists are able to generate is extraordinary and hit me in the face when I came back to government. That is, the ubiquity of devices and information and images and video in particular, but text and images of all kinds allowed all human beings to connect to each other in extraordinary ways, but to connect, to get close to the flames in a way that wasn't possible, a way that wasn't possible 15 years ago. You know, close your eyes and think back to that awful Tuesday 15 years ago, and there were no tweets from the towers, there were no texts from the towers, there were no real images sent from the towers. The horrific images that I still have in my head of those poor folks jumping out of the building, I don't think we saw that in video form until much later. But today, people can be at the Bataclan, right? can be in San Bernardino huddled behind a car while terrorists are, are firing military weapons at law enforcement and feel it in this intensely, intensely up close way over and over and over again. I'm there, I'm there. And what has struck me is the way in which that produces a velocity of fear that a spike of anxiety that is beyond anything I'd ever felt before. And you can spend all kinds of time, which is thoughtful, saying, well, but it's irrational to be that afraid that, that you're far more likely to be killed in an American city with a, by a gunshot from a gangbanger than to be killed by a terrorist. And all that's true, but the fear is real that people fear, feel. And it's, it's magnified, amplified, almost becomes a contagion by virtue of our access to the flames. And I felt it after San Bernardino in December. Even my own family members were asking questions like, are we OK? Are we going to be OK? And my answer was, yes, we're going to be OK. That you have to work to manage that anxiety. And I've explained to my family, and my, if my kids were here, they would groan, because they got training when I became director and all kinds of depressing things. But they got training in how to think about fear. And one of the things they learned is that there are four possible states of the world. There's red, which is you're in a fight. Stress hormones are coursing through your body. You're in a fight for your life. It's unsustainable long term. There's orange, which means you're on the cusp of a fight. The, the hormones are starting to course through you. And then I'll, there's yellow, which I'll come back to. And then there's white. White is headphones on, New York City subway platform, midnight texting, right? Obliviousness <laughs> to the world. Um, <laughs> The state my kids were coached to live in and that I would urge all Americans to live in is yellow. A healthy awareness that there are really bad things out there and people who do want to kill us, but not a disabling, unsustainable state of orange or red. So resist obliviousness, be aware of your surroundings, but resist what they want from us, which is a disabling state of fear. Live in yellow. And my kids are coached further, to show you how depressing it is, uh, two seconds means everything. You have two seconds once something happens to seek safety, to get out of the way, to get down. And two seconds, if you're in white, is like that. But if you're living in yellow, two seconds is a meaningful period of time. And so my urging of people is do not let them take advantage of this velocity of fear to paralyze us, but instead channel that awareness of bad things into a state of healthy awareness of your surroundings and go on living your life because you, especially in this great country of ours, have invested unbelievable amounts of money to build something that is competent. And we have a competent counterterrorism capability in this country. Let us do our job and enjoy the freedoms of this great country. Do not give them what they exactly want. And so those are two things I've been struck by coming back. The jointness of it all and the way in which fear is able to play such an enormous and spiky role in all of our lives. And with that, I'm going to shut up, John. Well, not for long. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, obviously, I want to talk about the email investigation while I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with a few questions on that. The, uh, <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> now, you were, um, you were in place as Deputy Attorney General when the decision was, was, uh, was made to create 
the, uh, the National Security Division. I was wondering if you could take us back a little bit to that time, and if you recall, what were the arguments against um, creating the National Security Division? What were your thoughts on it uh, at the time, and what do you think of them now? I don't remember all that clearly, the arguments against. Uh, I know there was concern, which was reasonable, about churn and morale, and if you separate out CTS and CES in particular, you lose some of the benefits of the brain power and the personnel and the structure around the entire criminal division, and you'll have to rebuild it, and that's inefficient. I remember being told that. Um, but I don't, I don't remember much about them, because I actually thought it was a fairly easy decision at that point in time, and that I thought it was important for a couple of reasons. First, I'll start with the least important, but most personal to me. I had no one else to send to all these stupid meetings for me. <laughs> that and, has not changed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we, at the Department of Justice, everybody else, all the other departments had assistant secretaries who had a portfolio that made sense that their deputy secretary could send them to a meeting at the White House in their place, and we had nobody. And so I had to go to every meeting as deputy attorney general, and that's a very small reason. But the, to me, the most compelling reason was a span of control problem. I thought it was impossible for the assistant attorney general in charge of the criminal division to effectively oversee and drive the operations of the non-terrorism parts of the criminal division, given the priority, of, uh, understandable priority, on counterterrorism in 2004 and 2005. And my view was, by necessity, you are going to have to neglect a huge span of work that we do on corruption cases, and child exploitation, and drugs, and violent crime. Because if you're the AAG, this is what the president wants you to focus on, and this is what the American people do. And that we were neglecting uh, really other important parts of the organization. And so it created a tremendous imbalance in terms of span of control. And so I thought a practical reason would be to have somebody waking up every day worrying about this, and somebody worrying up, waking up every day worrying about making sure this stays great. You talked a little bit about color coding. I'm not sure I caught all of the colors. Yeah. But as you uh, recall, and you've served in both administrations, in the prior administration, there was a system of putting out color alerts, uh, essentially. And there was a criticism that you're telling people to be on higher alert, and you're causing more fear, but you're not really enabling constructive action. And one thing I know in your current uh, role, and then as prosecutors we think about, is how do we describe what we see as the threats are publicly and candidly without inspiring terror. How do you do that balance now? It's not easy. Uh, I think probably in two ways. One is, or three ways. One is being as transparent as you can and as descriptive as you can be about the nature of the threat, which I think people find more useful than a label. You know, we're at uh, run for your life level or we're at run and hide level. But instead giving people information but then coupling that information with two things, context, explicit context about what we're doing to address that threat. Who's at work on it and what resources we're bringing to bear, all that's very important. The third bucket is harder to describe. I think it's tone and um, visual imagery. I think it's really important that when people are freaked, they see people who are depicted in a way and acting in a way that reassures them that grown-ups are working on this. And I've tried to think about how to do this well. I got uh, much mocked by my family for doing a press conference sitting down without my jacket on. Because I thought, well, that'll convey to people that, that I'm working. And one of my kids said, that'll convey to people you don't have your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I've, I've gotten away from that. But, but I do think that if we, we really, we're not actors, but we have to think about what's the image that people are taking from this encounter with us on their TV screen or on their device. Is it reassuring? Not patronizingly reassuring, but do these people look competent? And do they talk about things in a way that says, okay, that convinces us, oh, grown-ups have got this. I don't need to freak out so much. As we look ahead uh, towards next generation threats or over the next five or 10 years, you and others have quite uh, publicly discussed the threat posed by those who would attack cyber uh, through cyber enabled means. And uh, what do you see as the greatest threat as we move towards an internet of things? And how do you think the American people should think about it? 
I think the threat is just that the attack surface is much, much larger for criminals and creeps and, and anybody who wants to do harm to us in our lives just has another way to do it. Um, and so I think that the, it's inevitable we're moving in that direction. So I think people just need to continue to be sensible in their own sort of security hygiene and asking good questions and not assuming that somebody else has thought about this or someone else has taken care of their security. But as a good consumer, read about the security of devices and what, pe what steps people are taking to protect you. Do you still have a piece of tape over your uh, cameras Heck at yeah. home? Heck yeah. <laughs> and I also, I, much, I get mocked for a lot of things, much mocked for that. But I hope people lock their cars. I don't have them in my own car that I drive, but I'm sure we lock our FBI cars. Uh, lock your doors at night. I have an alarm system. You have an alarm system. You should use it. I use mine. I, it's not crazy that the FBI director cares about personal security as well. And so I think people ought to take responsibility for their own safety and security. And there's some sensible things you ought to be doing. And that's one of them. Every, every you go in any government office, we all have our um, little camera things that sit on top of the screen. They all have a little lid that closes down on them. You do that so that people who don't have authority don't look at you. I think that's a good thing. Do you, um, as we, uh, there's much discussion right now about uh, nation state threats that are th through cyber. And I guess a couple of questions on that. One, is there uh, any sort of activity, espionage, destructive activity, that because it's cyber enabled, you think should get a free pass from criminal investigation and prosecution? Uh, that's a no, John. <laughs> <laughs> and so to those who, and this question has been asked a fair number of times today, so I'll ask you, so to those who say, why haven't you done something about Russia? You've done something about China, North Korea, and Iran. How would you answer that? Well, we have a variety of tools that we as a government use to try and deter uh, behavior on the Internet outside of norms. And so that can involve a variety of things, only some of which would be visible to the public. So my answer, I'm not just talking about Russia, but just because you can't see something doesn't mean that your government's not doing something to try and change behavior. And what do you think, though, in terms of the role of the public, particularly the role of the public sector when it comes to responding to cyber threats? Can you effectively address a threat if the public doesn't know that you're doing it? How do you reassure them? How do you encourage them to come in and cooperate? I think you can. I think you, I hope people understand the explanation I just gave that that when we think it makes sense to do something overt and public to try and drive a change in behavior, as we did with the three PLA actors a year or so ago, that that people will know about that. But people can also understand we will be working to do other things, and and that to be able to do those other things, we need cooperation from the private sector. We need information from people, um, and so getting people. One of the big challenges, you know this, you've been dealing with this since you've been in office, that we face is getting the private sector to tell us when there's an intrusion. The majority of people who suffer an intrusion, we've discovered, do not contact law enforcement. And that is a depressing state of affairs, but that means we gotta work harder to build confidence in them that A, we need the information, and B, we will not re-victimize them with the way in which we handle that information. But that's step by step, building that, building that trust, case by case by case. How do you balance that? There are some who've said that because, for instance, the National Security Division working with the FBI pursued court process to try to obtain the contents of the iPhone of the mass murdering terrorist who killed multiple people in San Bernardino, mm -hmm. that because we used court process and tried to compel, that that would make it harder to get trust or cooperation. How do you see uh, the balance between those two objectives? I, I don't know. I hope that doesn't chill conversations and cooperation because we're transparent about what we're doing and why. Um, we had, a, to my view, a compelling purpose. We had strong legal arguments to ask the court, to ask the provider, to compel the provider to give us the assistance we needed. But none of that was sneaky. I mean, all of that was upfront. And I hope people can understand. They can disagree, but if they understand what we're doing and why, and that we're transparent and upfront about it, it's not gonna chill conversations, I hope. As we have those conversations going forward on, uh, on how to obtain information for a world of new communications, what do you see the role for the National Security Division team 
and the FBI? What's our role in that debate? Well, I think two things. Most importantly is to provide information, urging and information, that we have a serious conversation about the way in which the fundamental governance of the United States is changing. And I actually don't think that's an overstatement. I, what's happening to us, maybe without even realizing it is, we're moving to a place, which may be a wonderful place, but we ought to do it consciously. We're moving to a place where wide swaths of American life will be absolutely private. That is outside the reach, not just of creepy people, but outside the reach of judges. And that's a place we've never lived before. Because the bargain in the United States has always been, your stuff is private unless the people of the United States need to see it. And then with appropriate predication and oversight, they can get access to it, subject to judicial review or requiring a judicial order. And so if we're gonna move to a place where wide parts of our lives are outside the reach of judges, holy cow, I think we gotta talk about it. And I think our job is to make sure that we are pushing that conversation for a very practical reason, so we don't get to a place five years from now where I'll still be stuck in this dead-end job. And people, <laughs> and people look at us and say, how come you didn't say something? How come you didn't tell anybody? And so we're trying to tell people from the rooftops, life is changing, it has a big impact on our work, and maybe that's okay. Maybe the American people say, well, we see the costs, but there's so many benefits to absolute privacy, we wanna live that way. That's okay, but we ought to make sure that we do that in a, in a thoughtful way. So our job is to try to foster the conversation and fill it with actual facts and information. Because in the absence of that, it just becomes people shouting at each other on Twitter. And so I think we have a role to play in saying, here, American people, is how this is impacting the tools that you through Congress have given us. And here's qualitative descriptions of how it's ha affecting us, and here's quantitative. Here's the number of cases and the impact. It, what do you think? But I really do think we should pull ourselves back and not say, here's what the answer should be. Nor should the companies. I think we ought to all find a way to foster a conversation where the people, and whoever form that takes, probably legislative, the people figure out how they want to be. That's our job. How do you, you've uh, been at the department before and after the creation of the National Security Division. How do you compare the threat picture uh, now, let's say right after September 11th to now, 15 years after September 11th? The threat is uh, very, very different. It's changed just since I became director. Um, in some ways, it's, a, it's broader, in some ways more disconcerting by virtue of its breadth and the difficulty in seeing it, in some ways less. I can remember the feeling of 2002 and 2003 well, late 2001, 2002, 2003, of a tremendous worry about the next big thing. Obviously, we had anthrax in that period of time, but dirty bombs, gas, mass casualty events. And those, we haven't lost sight of worrying about that, but our, our focus now is on a much more disparate threat that I'm sure you've had lots of talk about that's hard to see, unpredictable, motivated and driven by people who are just uh, disturbed and, and unpredictable even to those who would motivate them and that makes it really really hard you know this but our daily job is finding needles in a haystack and as I like to say it's harder than that even it's finding pieces of hay that may become a needle that makes it harder and then once a needle is most dangerous it disappears because of the power of, of strong encryption and that's a recipe for a nationwide effort that is very very stressful not in the sense of the large explosive attack or the you know, chem bio attack, but in the sense that where in this country today is some troubled soul inspired by hyper violence that they see on the internet moving towards shooting people in a club or at, a, at an office gathering? Where are they and how do we find them and stop them? That's very stressful and really, really hard. So in that sense, it's a very different threat, hard, but hard in a different way than 15 years ago. Part of the, uh, you've described a very complicated threat environment, and part of the role of the National Security Division is to provide oversight. And Ken Weinstein spoke earlier today that he views as one of the great successes in his uh, tenure, the working with the FBI, so the National Security Division had oversight of the execution of certain national security authorities. As the leader of the FBI responsible for confronting these uh, threats, it's been my experience, uh, at FBI and in other places that oversight is not always appreciated um, when you're in the midst of having being overseen. 
How do you explain uh, the role of oversight and its importance? It's a huge pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> but it is essential. It's just essential for at least two reasons that pop into my head. One, the tyranny of the urgent is such especially when you confront this kind of threat, the pace is just extraordinary, that you could miss the fact that you're going sideways and that you're misusing an authority or you're coloring outside the lines in some way you hadn't even anticipated or intended. That's one. And the second is just the nature of people with power. It's a, I think John Adams said, power always thinks it has a great soul. We believe we're virtuous as human beings, but especially when we have a mission with rich moral content. So there's a danger that we'll fall in love with our own virtue and think, yeah, I'm awesome. I'm pretty awesome. And having people around to say, actually, you're not so awesome, and poking at you and pushing at you is really important. It's a huge pain, but it's necessary. So that oversight, the IG oversight, congressional oversight, all of it is a pain. But it's, given the nature of people and the nature of the mission, indispensable. Remember, yeah, you, you, you talking a little bit before about a change in uh, trust and the relationship of American people to trusted institutions like the FBI and the Department of Justice. Give us your thoughts on, do you think that's changed since you began as a prosecutor to now? And if not, um, how would you describe it? And if it has changed, how would you say it's changed? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think, in fact, I read I think yesterday I think it was yesterday or the day before I read a piece by David Brooks that I thought captured this so much better than I can. Uh, sort of an erosion of trust across the entire uh, scope of our country, really. As institutions break down and the things that were the centers in people's lives start to fragment, faith or family or civic institutions. So I, and I, that, plus the easy availability of our own personal echo chambers, um, my, my children, again, discipline me not to go on Twitter, because apparently people say bad things about me on Twitter. <laughs> um, but, but things like Twitter offer us the opportunity only to encounter views consistent with our own 24 hours a day. And it used to be that the person who's now on Twitter would be down at the end of the bar uh, late at night shouting at the television, and the only people he could shout with would be the other people who were down at the end of the bar. Well, now he can shout with 600 other people who are at their own metaphorical bars, and it's a constant reinforcement of their view of the world. What's so dangerous about that is the human brain has evolved to crave that kind of affirmation. I think the confirmation bias is the most powerful force uh, in our world. That, that is that I'm hungry for things that affirm what I already believe, and I may not actually consciously per even perceive facts inconsistent with what I already believe. That terrifies me. It should as a leader and as a human being. Now, think about that through the lens of a Twitter. There's an opportunity to feed that monster of a bias, that confirmation bias, all the time. So it accelerates that fractionalizing of our society, and it allows people, it makes it much harder for people like me, like you, like people here, to speak reason to folks about our institutions. And it allows corrosive doubts to become little teeny packets and stay in that bubble and be reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. You know, I, I'm not going to talk about the email investigation, but I see some of the things people say about this thing. I'm like, really? But there, it becomes truth to so many people, and I don't know how to unring that bell. Uh, and so I do think it's become enormously challenging for people in institutions that depend upon the trust of the citizens to recapture trust where it's been lost, explain ourselves in a way that allows them to resist uh, demagoguery or uh, the Twitterverse that drives them in a way that's crazy. And it's a very, very challenging time for us. Now, that said, we got to stay after it because despite, I don't know what your parents taught you, mine always taught me you can't care what people think about you. I do. I do because the institution I'm lucky enough to lead depends upon the American people believing that we are honest, competent, and independent. So when we rise before a jury or we speak in Congress or we speak in a cookout, we are believed because we're, they understand we're in the middle in American life. We don't carry water for somebody else. And so I deeply care what people think about us. And against the, the challenges I just laid out, it's a tall order to try to maintain the trust and foster trust 
or recapture it where it's been lost in that, in that uh, fractionalized world. Uh, but that, we can't give up. We just gotta keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and be as transparent as possible. I worry sometimes that people don't even, when I use the word transparency, I really mean as often as I possibly can, I will show you exactly what I'm thinking, exactly what I'm doing and why. I will show you when I'm stupid. I will show you, I hope sometimes when I'm smart. That's what I mean by transparency. Now in Washington, when I use that word, people think, what's he up to? There's something going on here. Uh, <laughs> something tricky here, because he can't really mean that. I really do. And, and maybe if you don't believe me after three years, three years from now you'll believe me. But that transparency, I think, is necessary as an antidote to this corrosive trust, that can, a lack of trust that can otherwise bleed into uh, our existence. And so that's my advice to anybody else who's in government. Hyper-transparency has to be your answer. Now, it's going to be forced upon you because the nature, everyone is the media today, so most things get found out. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but as often as possible to just say, in, not in scripted ways, but in, as spontaneous as you can, be as spontaneous as you can, say, this is what happened and why. Here's where we fell short, here's where we did well, and people will, I hope, come to rely upon that and realize we can actually trust these people. But it's a, it's a challenge. How do you balance, so we're up against an adversary now where we ought to have a huge information advantage. Um, they're located overseas. They're under fire in some instances, these terrorist groups. How do you balance that desire for transparency with a need to protect the sources and methods you're using to collect intelligence on the adversary? And one thing about the technical change that you've described is it means someone in a cave overseas can get access to breaking news on a 24-7 basis. So anything that's discussed in our media, as we know from Afghan intelligence, they read carefully. How do you balance that need for national security purposes with the transparency you need to earn the trust of the public? Not easily. Uh, you grapple towards some sort of healthy balance, first with a recognition that the way you think about transparency today must be different than you thought about it 20 years ago because the world has changed so much, so you, you shouldn't waste your time tilting at windmills, but you should pick those spots where we must protect information and protect it fairly aggressively. I, it, it is not, the way I talk about transparency is not a surrendering that all sensitive sources of methods information will inevitably make its way out. There has to be information that's protected, and I think we as investigators, you as prosecutors, have to aggressively prosecute where a clear line has been crossed. And it may not be easy in the abstract to define the line where we should have transparency is against secrecy, but in individual matters, it's not all that hard to figure out, and people should be held to account when they cross that line. You've talked about uh, uh, the Twitter verse and the use of social media as one that's been exploited by the Islamic State um, in the Levant. How do you, what do you view as the role of those who provide the platforms um, that are being used and what should their responsibility be? I think all of them should and do, those that I've dealt with, um, never want to be in a situation where people are using this thing they have created to harm innocent people. And Twitter is a terrific example. I think Twitter has done a great job especially in the last year to 18 months, of embracing that and having it reflected in the way in which they police the Twitterverse to try to make sure it's not being used by killers to sell their poison. Um, and so I think that's the way a responsible company, that's the way responsible individuals should act. Um, I've never liked the idea of us sort of uh, deputizing them and making them an arm of the government to police speech. First of all, I don't think that's appropriate in the United States. Uh, but I don't think it's necessary because once they see that we're not making this up, there really are really bad people trying to do really bad things to innocent folks, they'll want to be part of making sure that isn't done through their, their genius, their baby, their creation. Um, and so I think one of the things we've done better, you've done better, and our, and our colleagues have done better, is sitting with those folks and making sure they understand, here's the threat, and here's how it's coming at us. And this isn't some government puffing. You have a role to play as a citizen. We hope you will embrace it. Uh, do you think we're in the right place uh, in terms of our outreach and discussions with the private sector, or is there uh, room to grow? I think we're in a pretty good place. I, don't, I think we have a long way to go in terms of fostering a healthy conversation, however it comes out about encryption. 
and the, ch and the challenges it poses for us. Because it, it got spun into a, and I'm not picking on either side, but an exchange of tweets on a regular basis. And it's too complicated a thing for that. Too complicated technologically, too complicated as a matter of policy, too complicated as a matter of international norms. It's a really, really hard problem. And what I hope to do is help frame it in a healthier way, have people recognize we actually don't have a conflict in values. All of us care about the same two things, privacy and security on the internet, which I care deeply about, and public safety. And those are crashing into each other. And so what might we do to be able to optimize those two values? We may weigh them differently. You know, I see the world quite darkly, more darkly, I'm sure, than Tim Cook does because of what I see every day. And from his view, I think he could fairly say, you overweight darkness, you underweight innovation. And that's probably fair criticism. But we share the same values. And so that ought to be the basis for a, no screaming and twittering and bumper stickering, but a serious conversation about, so what's our problem? What are the costs and benefits? What could be done? And what should be done? And really have an adult conversation that way. And I don't think we've done a good enough job as a country of having that conversation. We've done a lot of shouting back and forth at each other, uh, both literally and, and metaphorically. And I, I think we need to get to a healthier place for a better conversation. Do you think, in terms of the role of national security lawyers, um, are there times national security lawyers should say no to an FBI request, even if they believe it to be lawful, because they believe the downside effect in terms of loss of trust of the uh, American people or potentially bad case law down the future or legislative um, response outweighs the benefit of using the legal tool? Sure, yeah. I mean, that, that, there's a healthy tension between agents and investigators. I didn't used to think this, but now I know agents are always right. <laughs> and the, investi the, the, uh, the, excuse me, between agents and prosecutors, agents are always right, prosecutors are always conservative weenies. And so that, uh, that, that healthy tension is good for us. You, may, you can act as a break on some of our enthusiasm, and we can pull and push the prosecutors sometimes. Those are terrific conversations. And they're bumpy, and they're messy, and people are screaming at each other. Then they go have a beer afterwards, and, and it's all good. But you need both to make sure, again, that we don't fall in love with our virtue, our passion for an investigation can be such that we may lose the bigger picture. As you said, see how the knock-on effects might uh, cause either public issues that might create problems or cause precedent problems. That's your job, and, and our job also, though, is to bang back and forth with you. And uh, I, back when you were a prosecutor, do you ever recall an instance of playing that uh, role without describing, I guess, the particular <laughs> case? <laughs> yes. Yeah, plenty of times. But it's a... Do you now realize how wrong you were? Now that you're yeah. out of the <laughs> <laughs> No, but I always admired the enthusiasm. And, and look, I, because, maybe because I've been trained as a lawyer, I find the adversarial system to be the one best designed to arrive at truth is an honest clashing of views. It's one of the things I try and foster as director. One of the challenges of being a boss, as I'm sure you know, is will people tell you when you're not making sense? And so what I like to do is foster a conversation, almost a, a litigation over an issue, so that we surface different points of view. And any time you're able to take that, which is so good, and make it part of a structure, which it is, as between prosecutors and agents, it's a recipe for goodness. Talk about that open uh, dialogue. I, I recall vividly uh, being in the FBI SIOC, where we do the morning intelligence briefing on your first day as FBI director. I had spent a long time uh, working for Director Mueller as his chief of staff. And you came in wearing some outrageous outfit. Uh, if I recall, your shirt was not white. I think that's right that and day, your, yeah. Your tie was not red. Yeah. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that was not an accident from your description in terms of the first day. I think I was drunk too, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did just no, say no. we should all get beers. No, they, no. Uh, uh, but um, what, what, what was your thing? Was that uh, it just happened to be what you picked that morning, or was that conscious? And what, what are your thoughts on how you encourage a culture where people debate honestly? I think what's, I used to tease Bob. I used to remind Bob, I, I was his supervisor when I was Deputy Attorney General. He didn't acknowledge it, and I now no longer acknowledge it. <laughs> but, uh, but I used to tease him about only wearing white shirts and either a blue tie or a red tie. 
And so I thought it'd be fun to mix it up. So I go crazy. There's blue, and then there's white, and there's blue, and then there's white. Uh, but I tell you, it's a one of the things that's both uh, terrible and wonderful about being a leader is that people watch you, and you can't ever take a play off because they're watching you. They watch where you go. They watch where you stand. They watch how you dress. They watch who you talk to. They watch what you eat. And so it's important that that's a pain because you're never alone, but it's an opportunity because I actually think the best way to shape a culture is actually not explicitly because culture is defined as the way things are really done no matter what they tell you in training. So you actually can't explicitly shape a culture. The way you do it is modeling the way you want to be. And so I really want to model leadership that is confident and humble. I want open, transparent leaders who will have a conversation with their people and get better by virtue of it. That's always been my style. And so one of the ways I try and manifest that is the way I dress. I try not to wear my jacket. I try every day I possibly can to go get my own lunch, stand in line, and chat with people. Part of that is I'm hungry, but part of it is <laughs> I'm trying to demonstrate a certain approach to leadership. And the good thing is other leaders will copy that. And if you're intentional about that, knowing you're going to be copied, you can use it 